I like science fiction. Uh, when I was a teenager, I, I read a lot of it, and I think it actually contributed to my decision to eventually become a, a researcher in science. I don't think one should take it terribly seriously, but it can you know, give particularly young people, I think, uh, inspiring ideas. And it's true that some science fiction writers have come up with some, some great suggestions for the future. I think of Arthur C. Clarke and artificial satellites, for example. Uh, and I could even give a, other examples. For example, some I, modern ideas in string cosmology. I can see a connection with one of the science fiction books that I read when I was a teenager. So, yeah, fun to read, ideas, but don't take them too seriously. In the case of Robert Sawyer's book, it seems to me that it's actually you know, more of a, a speculation than he tries to suggest. I, I think the physics that he puts in there is, to my mind, very implausible, not to say impossible. But that doesn't mean to say that the idea is not interesting, that one could somehow uh, project forward into the future one's consciousness, but it's not going to happen in the way that he describes. I would just like to, to emphasize that there's just absolutely no way at all that the events that he describes in his book could conceivably have the consequences that he describes. This is totally impossible. What he describes you know, in his book, uh, I think, is amusing, but it has nothing to do with the science. We've never seen anything like that in, uh, in any of our experiments. There are some theoretical speculations that it, that it might occur, uh, and I don't think the possibility has been completely excluded. But if it did exist, I suspect it would occur only on microscopically small timescales, uh, far, far smaller than anything that the human mind can, uh, can appreciate. So uh, uh, an interesting story to follow, but as I said, I don't think it's going to have any implications for human beings. So the main business of the LHC is to collide protons, each of them with an energy, roughly speaking, that of a fly. Now, uh, a lead ion consists of something like 200 protons and neutrons uh, bound together. Uh, each individual one will have uh, less energy than a single proton in the LHC. But let's say the total energy is something like colliding 100 flies from this direction and 100 flies from that direction. Now, all these flies are not in the same space, so it's in place, they're sort of spread out in space. So this means that you don't concentrate all the energy at one point. Instead, the main uh, objective of these collisions of lead ions is to produce an extended heated form of plasma similar to what existed in the early universe when it was a microsecond old. Now, because this energy is spread out, it's a very small volume, but by the standards of particle physics, it's quite a large volume. Because this energy is spread out, uh, it's very difficult to imagine that it could be used to produce a Higgs boson. So, in fact, when people are talking about producing the Higgs boson at the LHC, uh, they talk about producing the Higgs boson in proton-proton collisions, not in heavy iron collisions. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there between uh, Sawyer's scenario and uh, what a purebred particle physicist would suggest, but no, it's not a big deal. Oh, wish that we could be so lucky. I think it's going to be very tough to find the Higgs boson. When the LHC starts up, it's not going to be that on, on day two, uh, some particle comes out, waves a flag and says, hi, I'm the Higgs boson. Uh, we expect that even in proton-proton collisions, Higgs bosons are going to be produced at the rate of perhaps one in a billion or one in a trillion or one in ten trillion events. They're going to be very, very rare when they do appear. And uh, they're going to be difficult to distinguish from the other things that are happening in the collisions all the time. So it's going to take uh, time and effort to sift through all these signals and pick out a very small signal from uh, quite a big background of, of other junk events that we're not interested in. So I'm afraid, no, it's not going to be a, a dramatic eureka moment. It's going to take a, a long time to build up the necessary evidence. It turns out that actually a large fraction of the high-energy cosmic rays are actually heavy nuclei. Uh, so, in fact, heavy iron experiments are being done, have been done by nature also 
for billions of years. Uh, nuclei, perhaps not as heavy as lead, but certainly as heavy as iron, have been striking the Earth's atmosphere for billions of years. Uh, they've also been striking other astrophysical objects, uh, things like neutron stars, for example, and uh, nothing cataclysmic has happened. So the same arguments can be carried over to uh, the heavy iron case. It's a little bit more complicated to carry through, but the basic conclusion remains the same. It seems to me that uh, neuroscience in general, and specifically the origin of consciousness, is an absolutely fascinating area. Uh, and you know, I think it's um, very important to understand the fundamental physical processes that are going on inside the brain. Now, there have been some conjectures that quantum physics plays an essential role. Uh, that may be the case. I don't see any direct evidence yet that that's uh, really, in fact, the situation. Uh, but there are some very distinguished theoretical physicists, Roger Penrose comes to mind, who have conjectured that there might be some connection between fundamental quantum processes and, uh, and the brain. Um, it's not something that has directly to do with particle physics, but it certainly is a very interesting uh, speculation. It seems to me that the idea that all the video cameras and all the weather monitoring stations would, would stop, I'm sorry, but that's not scientifically correct. According to quantum mechanics, just uh, different parts of the universe interacting with each other act as observers. It's not necessary that there actually be a, a consciousness, if you like, behind the eyes looking. Uh, so I, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what an observation means in quantum mechanics. In nature, there, there are two different types of particles. There are the particles of matter, which are what we call fermions. The electron is an example. And then there are the particles that carry the forces. They're called bosons. Now, the Pauli principle applies to the fermions, the matter particles, like the electron. And in fact, it's the Pauli principle that prevents electrons from collapsing because it tells you you can't pile lots and lots of electrons all into the same low-energy state. Uh, they have to somehow stay away from each other. That way they gradually populate all the energy states of the, of the atom. So the, the Pauli principle does not apply to bosons. It only applies to these matter particles. Now, I don't see any way in which one could somehow make a connection between time and the properties of those matter particles. Perhaps conceivably with the properties of bosons, but, but not with the properties of matter particles. So it's an amusing idea, but I think there's actually no physical basis for it.